Next one, are there any plans to retrofit the features of NSX for vSphere into NSX for multi-hypervisors? Yeah, I'm glad this question was asked. So before there was a question about is an NSX for vSphere a separate deployment than NSX for multi-hypervisor separate controllers? The answer is yes. What is common is the API that they will expose northbound. What will be different are the implementation details and some feature differences for now. What we fully intend to do is to merge those two platforms over time. We've already talked about the NSX V switch that is in the ESXi hypervisor today. So you can begin to see where this is going, where we take things like that stateful kernel distributed firewall that's in NSX for vSphere that becomes available in the multi-hypervisor deployment and the kind of features move into there. So long answer is yes. Oh, this is a good one. Is it possible for a VM guest to have both VXLAN NICs and traditional VLAN NICs at the same time? I definitely know it's possible in the vSphere case because there you just have different port groups and if you have a VM with multiple NICs, you connect one NIC to a VXLAN-backed port group and another NIC to a VLAN-based port group and you're done. But what about the multi-hypervisor case? How do we handle it there? In the multi-hypervisor, you're creating logical switches and all of that is based on overlay networking. So you would take your VM and connect it to one or more logical switches and those would be doing the VXLAN or SAT or GRE tunneling. Well, as, as a point of clarification there, if we were looking at this in a, let's say, just for sake of discussion, an OpenStack environment, we could potentially take an instance and attach it to a network which is represented by a logical switch and then attach it to a network that's represented by a bridged network which would be the equivalent of a VLAN type piece, thus accomplishing the same effect. And that latter piece, Scott, would be something outside of the NSX domain, right? Yeah, it would probably be something outside of NSX using one of the other OpenStack networking models. Yeah, yeah, okay. We got an answer from the audience as well saying you can create bridged connectors on the hypervisor that pass through to the underlay within the NSX domain. So thank you, Brad. The other Brad, the audience Brad. How about ERGRP support now that it's open sourced? We have no plans to implement EIGRP at this point. Of course, if there's enough customer demand, anything's possible, but right now there's no plans. A more serious one is authentication supported on OSPF and BGP. I don't know offhand the answer to that question. I know that we support filtering on BGP, yeah, I know there's a huge list of BGP features that are supported. I never even tried to use BGP authentication. So I got an answer back. We do not support BGP auth yet. There's the question of which vendor will support layer two gateways. As I said before, look up the NSX partners that were announced at VMware and track their press releases. Or do you want to add more, Brad? I think that's the right answer. There was a number of partners demoing gateways on the show floor. That information is out there. And we expect that more will work with us in the future. Is stateful firewalling supported in the distributed router or only in layer 3 gateway node? It's supported in both cases because it's implemented in the hypervisors. It's not implemented in the gateway node. Will OVS be ported to NSX for vSphere? So OVS is ported into the ESX kernel, and that's called NSX vSwitch. So NSX for vSphere is using the existing vDistributed switch 5.5, and you get the NSX goodness on that. So we kind of see that NSX vSwitch is kind of the path forward for if you want to get the goodness from OVS, in an ESX environment, you're going to begin to you know, leverage the NSX V switch and look at the NSX for multi-hypervisor environment. And then there are people asking about the encrypted layer two extension for NSX for vSphere. So layer three can obviously be done with two NSX edge services routers and an SSL VPN or IPsec VPN tunnel between them, but what about layer two extension? 
Yes, you can do that, and that's one thing we didn't have a slide on, but just like we had the slide showing NSX from multi-hypervisor doing layer two extension between sites, you can do the same thing in NSX for vSphere on the NSX Edge Services router. It supports layer two VPN, so I can connect an NSX Edge Services router in data center number one to another one in data center number two over a layer two VPN tunnel, and I can establish a stretched layer two segment between those two sites. Yet again, I would say don't do it, but you can if you wish. Your choice. We know that we need the oversized packets to transport the user data. If I have an MTU mismatch in the core and that packet would be fragmented, do you set the don't fragment bit so that there is never any fragmentation or do we have to do reassembly then on the other end in the hypervisor? Trying to follow the question. So you see we have the 1600 byte packet sent by the hypervisor, 15 something, you know, over 1500. And now it hits a 1500 MTU link in the core because someone misconfigured the core. Will it be fragmented or does it have don't fragment bit and so it will be dropped? I don't know if the do not fragment bit is set or not, but my suspicion would be that the behavior you can expect would be that that packet would be dropped. Hopefully, because you wouldn't want to reassemble on the other end. Yeah, I mean, that's what we've seen before where a link didn't have a MTU setting that the just packets weren't going through. Okay, back to OVS and NSX for vSphere. Is in vSphere the flow or forwarding programming proactive? Or is it relying on VXLAN flooding to build the MAC table information for logical networks? In NSX for vSphere, everything is proactive, right? Because the NSX controller has knowledge of all the VMs and all of their MAC addresses and what VXLANs they're on. It also knows all of the hypervisors and what their VTEP IP address is and what virtual machines they have and which VXLAN segments. So all of that information is known. And so it pushes that information down to the hypervisors. So all of that is preemptive. Hypervisor is going to have a lot of information before the first packet is even sent. So next one, when using distributed router among subnets, how does the ingress know which layer two domains belong to the same tenant and others do not? It's all configured in NSX controller. And then that information is pushed down to the distributed switching modules. So Whenever you get a packet from a VM, you already know in which logical subnet it is, and you also know in which logical router it is, and the forwarding entries for that logical router only have the information that belongs to that tenant, so the separation is automatic. Can I connect 20 data center NSX sites over DCI, and what topologies are supported? 20 data centers. <laughs> I had to read this one. I couldn't yeah. resist. Well, let's go back. Well, let's think of that slide that we showed earlier where we were extending layer two between data centers with NSX for multi-hypervisor. So what we're doing now is we say you can have three sites and that they would be fully meshed together. So site one connected to site two, site one connected to site three, site three connected to one and two, site two connected to one and three, so on and so forth. So that's the topology we support in NSX for multi-hypervisor. We're calling that multi-domain interconnect in our documentation. So if you have your hands on our documentation, pull up the chapter on MDI and all of that is explained. So the answer is read the documentation. Yep, we support three sites in an MDI deployment. So just pull up the chapter in MDI and all of that will be explained. To find other virtual networking, data center, and cloud networking webinars, visit ipspace.net.